So good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very uh, really excited about this opportunity to talk to you about team-based learning in online classes. Uh, okay, wait, wait, let me uh, enable the transcription. Thank you. So I will first give a broad overview of what TBL is and describe the instructional sequence of TBL. Then we will discuss how to conduct, uh, conduct TBL online. So TBL is a form of collaborative learning that uses a flipped classroom instructional approach. It follows a specific sequence of events, including student preparation out of class and engaging students and learners in application activities within small groups in class. So one, one might ask, why isn't TBL just like any other group work? So I'm glad you asked that question. So the difference is TBL is a comprehensive instructional system with core connected elements, which we will discuss in a moment. Uh, so it shifts the instructional focus from the knowledge transmission by the instructor and uh, to knowledge application by the learner. So TBL has four essential elements. First, the instructor forms groups of five to seven students at the beginning of the course. Uh, these student groups are permanent, unlike other small group learning activities that may use temporary groups. The second element is readiness assurance. I will go into a little more detail about this readiness assurance process in a few in, in the next slide. The third element of TBL is application exercises where teams apply the knowledge they have acquired. Then the last element of TBL is evaluation in which students provide both formative and uh, summative feedback to their teammates about their contributions to the team. Now let's review the instructional sequence for TBL. The first step is advanced preparation by students before class. Students study assigned materials, which may be textbook readings, like YouTube videos, pre-recorded lectures, or journal articles to acquire the foundational knowledge. Then in class, students take an individual readiness assurance test. This is a, a, typically like a short multiple choice test on the key concepts from the pre-work. Then students, so students, when they take the test, the individual test, they do not get the score or the feedback on the individual test. So they don't know what they got right, what they got wrong. Then they take the same test in their groups where they negotiate back and forth and reach the, until they reach consensus on their answers. The most important thing in this step, in the, in the team test is for students to get immediate feedback on their team answers. Then in step four, the groups have the opportunity to write appeals for their answers to questions they got wrong. The, the students have to make valid arguments and cite evidence from the pre-work. Then the instructor gives a very short and very targeted lecture to clarify any misunderstandings or address any gaps that, were, that, were, that became apparent during the team, the team test. Then in step six, Groups complete 4S application activities in which they apply what they learn to authentic problems or case scenarios. So we will discuss what the 4S stands for in, in a few minutes. This sequence, this instructional activity sequence can be repeated five to seven times per course, per semester. So, so how can we adapt the traditional face-to-face -to -face TBL to online TBL? So if you want to go all high-tech, InterDashboard is a platform that is designed specifically for TBL. So it's very sophisticated. This instructor can monitor the student's progress in real time. So when they are doing the individual tests, when they're doing the team tests, and when they're doing the application activity uh, exercises. So all that sounds good, but of course it, it costs money. So I don't know how much it costs, but I have included a link to, the, to a short video about it if you'd like to take a look. So our focus today, will be on how you can make use of tools that you already have at your disposal to, for online TBL. So let's begin with the readiness assurance process. In the face-to-face -face traditional TBL, feedback is given through the use of immediate feedback assessment technique form. This form is similar to like a lottery scratch of card 
where stu students scratch off the forms to reveal the answer for each question. And I have a screenshot of one here where like uh, this team got, you know, they, they scratched at, on first attempt, they got four points. Then on the second question, they had to, to scratch uh, two, attempt, two scratches. So because, because they scratched twice, then they didn't get the full score. They got like two scores. So they, the student, students are awarded partial credit when they, when, they, they, when they require more than one scratch to get the correct answer. So alternative platforms that we can use for online TBL are Blackboard and Zoom. So Dr. Seston and I have conducted several faculty development uh, sessions on online TBL, and we've used Blackboard and Zoom for the readiness assurance process. So you can have students take the tests in Blackboard and uh, using adapt, uh, adaptive release, set the group test to open about 10 minutes after the individual test. Because if you have them both open at the same time, at, at times students may not pay attention and they'll take the group test instead of beginning with the individual test. Then put the, the students in breakout rooms in Zoom uh, to, to take the group test and ask students to pick one person to enter the team answers. So it's not everyone. So if you have like six groups, you can either pre-assign the person who will enter the team answers, or you can, you can ask the students to, to, uh, to pick someone from their team to enter the team answers in, in, uh, in Blackboard. So the group test should be set to show the score and feedback on submission. You could quickly take a peek at the, at the grade center to see the performance before you, so that you know which areas you will address in your, if you need to give like a, a, a targeted lecture. Then have students come back into the main room where you give them a short lecture to clarify any misunderstandings and address any gaps. So for example, let's look at, at an example here. So we have two items on the screen uh, and look at, looking at the performance of, on these two items. Uh, so you'll need to give a, a brief lecture on the content for question five because all five answer options were selected by the students and that may imply that a few students did not understand the material. And so for, and on question three, you see like uh, all the team, uh, all the students got it uh, correct. So you'll know that, that that was well understood, that material was well, well understood. So now let's look at the 4S application activities. So once students come back, so once you give the targeted lecture in the main room in Zoom, you can, you can have students head back to the breakout rooms to work on the 4S application activities. And the four S, uh, as you see on the screen, stands for significant problem, specific choice, same problem, and simultaneous report. So the significant problem should be an authentic scenario that students are likely to encounter in the real world. For example, if it's in a peer education, you could use a patient case that students may face in practice when, when they're in the clinic. The problem should have a specific answer among clear alternatives. For instance, if it's at the same in peer education and you give them a, a patient case and you're asking them to pick, a, a, you know, like the treatment, so then the question might be, which of the following is the best treatment option? So they, so they have to, to among like clear alternatives, they have, they have to pick the best treatment option. Then all teams should work on the same problem in order to generate a robust discussion between groups then the answers should be reported simultaneously so differences among teams can be discussed. So the first three can be done in, in the breakout rooms and, and just as you would uh, circulate around the face-to-face, -face, uh, if you're doing a TBL face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, you would circulate among, around the room to see the, how teams are progressing. So you would do the same in Zoom. So pop into the breakout rooms to check the progress to check uh, how the teams are, and, and answer any questions if necessary. Then teams can come back to the main room and report out their answers by, by holding up a, a letter card. So I, I don't have an example of that uh, handy with me, but you create letter cards where if it's a multiple choice question, you have, they have like A, B, C, D, and then they hold up the, co the correct answer that the team chose, or they could type the answers in the chat or they could use polling. So you have like Zoom polling, or you have a, you can use any other polling uh, software. Okay, now as, as uh, let us answer a couple of questions using two of these methods. So the next slide will we'll practice an, a, a, an application activity. So please read through this scenario and type your answer in the chat.
or if you'd like, you can open your mic and just share it out aloud. So I see create teams, developing assessment items. And just to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to reinforce like the teams, you can create the teams before the, the class begins and they, they should be permanent throughout the, the class. Then developing assessment items I, and I, that uh, multiple choice question items are not easy to develop. So you'll need uh, uh, to get some maybe help to develop those also. So that will have some, uh, you know, like a learning curve. Familiarizing with tools to implement versus in person. That, yeah, that's really important. And planning how many TBA like iterations you should have throughout the term. That's also really important. When you're starting out, maybe you could just start out with one. So we had in one of the sessions we did with the Dr. Sesson, one of the faculty development sessions, we have a faculty in dentistry who started with one TBL last fall, and they also wanted to do one in the spring, but because of the COVID, they, uh, they, they were not able to do it. But you can start small, and then when once you get uh, once you get your footing and you, you you master how to do it, then you can go to the recommended five to seven uh, per, per course. All right, thank you so much for sharing. Okay. So next, we will, uh, next we have polling. You could also use the polling feature in Zoom or use one of the free polling websites uh, like, um, you know, like you have like Mentimeter or some, some of the one that others that you use. So if you would please, so let me share my a poll that I have in here. If you would please answer the question on your screen. And some of this came in, in the chat in the previous question. So I see uh, online facilitation skills and I'll share the results with you. So I, I see like, a. Technology coordination is getting more people. And then we also have online facilitation skills. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a few, like 10 more seconds to complete the poll, if you could. Okay, so let me share the results. Okay, so I, can you see the poll? There's a results on your end. Okay, yeah, so we see all five were, were uh, chosen. So we have like, a, so the main one is the technology coordination. Because as you see from this, from this uh, presentation, you'll be going between Blackboard and Zoom or any other technology that you're using. Then we also have like online facilitation skills. And this is where maybe you can start with one and, and to, to test the waters, to work out any bugs that, uh, that uh, you know, with, with the technology. Then you, once you get comfortable, you can increase the number of TBLs that you do throughout the semester. Then process coordination. So th that also speaks to starting with one to get uh, your footing, then you can, then you can add more uh, sessions. And thank you for participating in the poll. So I'll stop sharing that and close. There is a question in the I'm chat. Sorry from um, Joe. Oh, oh, thank you. So, so, it, so it's not happening every time the class meets. So for instance, if you have like a 15 week course, you can plan to, to have at least maybe five to seven TBLs in the, uh, in the course of the semester. So like it's because it, you know, it, it requires a lot of preparation. You, you, you need to have like the tests, the, the test for, so it's the same test for the, individual and, and group and group test, then prepare application activities. So moving right along, 
So the next is that the final element is peer evaluation. Students are encouraged to give constructive feedback and not be judgmental of their peers. And this is both like, a, this is a good for like a, both a summative and formative evaluation. So they write things that they request and what they, uh, what they appreciate of their teammates and what they request from their teammates. So you, you can use a paper evaluation form, just the, like the one you see on the screen and call it the feedback and email it to students. So that's how the traditional TBL is done. And, but also there's, there's so many applications that, uh, that you can use online. In a previous session, Dr. Odeski shared several online platforms that can be used for peer evaluation. So that recording is available on the Center, Center for Teaching and Learning website if you'd like to take uh, uh, to review some of the sp specific tools that she shared. Okay, so we're almost done. I, I will wrap this up with a knowledge check. So you're not getting off so easily. <laughs> so, okay, please type your answer in the chat. Okay, so let me, let me pull up the chat here. Oh. Oh, oh, Joe, the message came to me. Do you want to put it to, to everyone? Your, your chat came to directly to. Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to kind of the same thing. Oh, didn't I'm sorry. To. Yeah, please type your answer to this question in the chat. So there's. <laughs> so we have D, we have A. Okay, D, D. Okay, so D is the correct answer. And a TBL has four essential elements. So you first form the teams outside of class. Then you, you then the second element is readiness assurance where you give them the, the, uh, the students do a test and individual and take the same test as a group and the tests are based on their pre-work that they did outside of class, then the students engage in the application activity, then there's peer evaluation. Okay, so I also just want to add that uh, empirical studies of TBL have reported in increased test performance, increased student engagement, retention of material, and good attitudes to towards group work. And also st students have expressed like satisfaction with their learning experience. And that's something as we as educators strive uh, to provide for our students. So, so here are some uh, are useful, uh, useful references and these slides, we'll send out these slides and some handouts that will help you uh, to give you more information if should you want to maybe uh, try to be here. And I would like to leave you with these uh, wise words by Benjamin Franklin as you endeavor to engage students in your classrooms. Yeah, thank you so much for your active partic participation. I'm happy to answer any questions. And also, if you're doing TBL, feel free to share how you're doing it in your classroom, either online or a face-to-face -face TBL. Thank you. So thank you I will- so much, Dr. Kulo. I think Ashley had uh, her hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much uh, for that presentation. I was interested in hearing a little bit more about, um, you know, since you mentioned this is a type of flipped classroom activity, you know, for when flipped classrooms in, include, you know, group learning, um, how that peer evaluation process, since that seems to be, you know, something that is like you know, may not be included in a typical flip classroom scenario, like how, what the impact of that peer evaluation process is. Yeah, thank you for that question. So the, so the, the peer evaluation give, ha, helps students to be accountable to their team. So, and it also gives them fast, it's important for, to give formative and summative evaluation so students can know how they're performing and where they can improve and also how, how they're participating in their teams. So it makes them accountable to themselves and also to their teams because they'll get points. Their, their, their final score will be based on their, their scores that the team members give them. 
So when they, when they give when they do the pre work because for the team for the group test they will they discuss and come to a consensus. So their teammates will um, will will score them best on their participation, how they came prepared, how how they participated in the like like uh, in the group answers. Then so they, then the instruct so the instructor gives uh, so for instance if the the team the peer evaluation contributes twenty five percent of the score. 25 uh, points of the score, then each you distribute the 25 points among your, say, five team, uh, your five colleagues and on, the, on their preparation and uh, uh, participation. So because it, it, it uh, contributes to their final score, it makes them accountable and it also helps, it's important because of the, the you know, like it gives them a formative and summative assessment where to improve. And so it's meant to be constructive. And so it's encouraged for, for peers, for your, for students to give like constructive feedback and not be like judgmental of their peers. So they say, this is something I appreciate. You came in prepared. And this is something I like, I would request of you to do. So maybe, you know, speak out more in the, in the, you know, in the, in the discussions. So it's a constructive feedback. And it also helps as students to, to get like um, in, into, to, to, up, to, to, up, yeah, like to, to, to de develop skills of uh, giving, feedback, giving and receiving feedback. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I like how that, how there are then, like you're saying, like there's really two accountability mechanisms built into the process. Like there's the one accountability mechanism for did you prepare to come to group work and then the accountability mechanism for the group work. Thanks. Violet, I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about um, you know, how TBL works with existing lecture material. I think this is a question that sometimes comes up. Faculty think, well, it's a new way of um, organizing the classroom and I have to kind of blow everything up and create stuff all over again. So I was wondering, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how it can work with a faculty member or instructor's um, existing lecture based or course presentation materials. Okay, yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, and so this is, this doesn't mean that if you start TBL, you throw out everything that you're doing. This is something that you can, you know, like add, you can in, incorporate in what you're already doing. So instead of, uh, you know, if you're, if you're giving a lecture uh, or you have like, a, you may have like a discussions, like a group discussions, which are temporary, so what you can do, you can switch switch that and have students uh, do like a, do the pre-reading instead of you coming and giving them the foundational knowledge, have them do it outside of class, assign them the pre-readings or a, you know like a recorded lecture. So they study that, then they come in and do like application exercises. So you're not throwing out, you're just uh, switching around how you've been doing things and making the students more engaged and involved in the learning process. Thank you. Thanks so much. Other questions for, for Violet? Um, I have another question, sorry. And I never lowered my hand, I realized, but um, let me take that down. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, so, you know, if you're doing a number of TBL sequences over the course of a semester, um, are you noticing, well, one, is is there, is it like best practice to sort of have like a practice round or are you noticing, are you doing the formative group work assignments sort of ahead of time um, and then moving into summative ones or like, do you notice that, you know, obviously are students getting better at it at a certain point in the term? Um, anyway. Yeah, so it's best practice or what I've seen like in, in being done is the first one is like a dry run because that's maybe the students might be doing it for the first time so they come in and they uh, they so that one they will not maybe they might not have a, a pre-reading but they come in just to and to work out any you know uh difficulties with technology because you want them you want everything to run smoothly you don't want to work, to waste class time you know doing like tech uh like uh, solving tech issues so the first one is for them to know how it will run so they do the individual test, 
then they go into their group, they take the, the, the group test and they, they receive the feedback. Then they have like application activities. Then so, then, so the second one, from the second to the nth one, whichever how many you have, that those, that, that, those are the ones that will start counting towards the, the final grade. And so the, the, and the grade might, that should not, it, uh, normally is not like the only grade for the course. So say TBL might be like 15%. Percent of the fifteen percent of the the entire grade, and in that fifteen percent, that what it, it, it comprises of the individual test, the group test, and for and then it will count to fifteen percent towards the entire grade. And that it's it maybe like five TBLs, say it's five TBLs across the semester. So it's good to have a, a dry run first. Then students are normally uh, when they come in, they get they, they know what to do, and they they first come and start the test, then go to their groups. So the ones they have the dry run, they know what to do next. It kind of sounds like a um, integration of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development theory, because first it's um, the direct instruction is what you provide with the pre-recorded lectures and the readings. And then the student, um, um, the, the zone of proximal development part is like the space between what they can do on their own without assistance and what they need that social contact with more capable peers to work through um, before they can develop their own level of competency for mm -hmm. some of these things. So I, I kind of like this a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and I know, Catherine, you came to one of our sessions earlier on last year to one of the faculty development sessions. <laughs> yeah, I, I've um, really enjoyed the, um, the um, scaffolding approaches and um, this kind of fits in with that. And there's a post in the chat, Violet, I'm not sure if, uh, Zach put in about what they do in his program, his course. Oh, thank you, Zach. And Zach is a, 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 like a pro in this. I would like to for Zach to share with us what he's doing. He's like, he does this in the School of Pharmacy. Zach, would you like to share? Uh, I can share. I was, I, Lynn told me there was a TBL, TBL session going on. So I figured I would hop on. Um, uh, but I guess to answer the question, we uh, do not underestimate the importance of um, that initial orientation session. The entire semester really is contingent upon everyone being on the same page from the get go. So, I mean, Violet, you hit the nail on the head. Do a dry run session so that it, there's no tension, there's no stress about what's going to be involved with the wrap process and what the expectations are. And it really sets your entire semester up to be way more successful. Thank you, thank you, Zach. And 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 not to put you on the spot, could you share how students receive receive TBL in your course? Um, you know, I so I've managed a, a course for about five years here at the School of Pharmacy, and I've done a handful of different flipped classroom um, strategies, and none have been better received and more effective than TBL. And I say that from both a student perspective as well as the faculty perspective. Um, and I, I mean, I, I know that I'm, I have my own biases, but I, I think TBL is just a, an incredibly robust um, uh, instructional approach. And, and I think we see, see it pay dividends in the students as well. And if it's done effectively, in, in my experiences, the students really do enjoy it. They get into a rhythm and it's very predictable and students want predictability, right? That's kind of a safe zone. And that cycle, so to speak, where they know what to expect every time they come into the classroom um, goes a really long ways. Can I ask that just what, um, like maybe anecdotally or from a feedback perspective, are faculty telling you why they find it to be enjoyable? Um, so I, I think it's, you know, what do faculty compare it to? And I think when they compare it to some of the other active learning strategies in the classroom, the benefit of TBL is that one, it incentivizes students to really know the information coming into class. And so they're not talking to students that haven't done the material. Um, two, it holds them accountable for being in the classroom. 
I have done a number of active learning sessions where there's 20 out of 100 students there. And um, I, I think that's discouraging for a lot of faculty. You can be the best uh, facilitator in the world, but students, if they don't have to come to class, a lot of times they don't want to if they don't know the benefits of being there. What's fun is seeing that students in the TBL environment actually want to be in class because they realize that being there really helps to solidify the learning that goes on. Um, I think those are probably two of the biggest reasons faculty have enjoyed it. But I, I've also heard a number of faculty say it, it really helps them become a better teacher. The facilitation that's involved with TBL um, really forces you to take a step back and, and realize that you're there to kind of facilitate the teaching that occurs, not to just lecture at someone. And I think faculty find that um, rewarding. Ashley, I think has her hand up. Yeah, I have a question. And then I saw Isabel just posted a question in the chat. Um, I was just wondering, and this might sort of dovetail into Isabel's question, um, if there's, and you may have mentioned this, but um, if that, like first accountability mechanism of the test can be some other form that's not a test, like a free writing or something like a little more um, like relaxed so that students, you know, can do it individually on their own and then come together as a group to discuss and then ask those kind of clarifying questions of the faculty member, you know, in a more discussion format with like all groups then discussing it with the faculty member before moving on to the group work? Um, or is it really, you know, and, and also I'm just thinking like, what's less work for the faculty in preparing for this? Like, might I be able to say, um, you know, here's a question I want you to contemplate for, you know, a 15 minute free write kind of thing, instead of, you know, developing test questions. So I would comment on that, like, uh, if you have like the multiple choice tests, they're, you know, they're hard to write, but once you have them, you can reuse them year after, you know, like within your courses. For the writing exercise, and, and that, and, and just to keep it, to, if you're doing the core uh, TBL, so you'll need to maybe to do the MCQs, the multiple choice questions, but if you, if you maybe tweak it, then you, you also have to keep in mind of time, because writing will take more time. Than, in, than answering like 10 uh, multiple choice questions. So you'll have to, you don't want to waste so much time on the readiness assurance process and not have enough time for the application because that's the most, you want to, the students to apply the knowledge to, to like uh, exercises. So maybe I think the, mot, the once you have the questions written out, you can, then you can reuse them over and over. And Ashley, just to elaborate on what um, Dr. Hulo said, is that there have been, um, I've seen iterations of TBL where the pre, the individual readiness test is given um, in Blackboard, independent of the group um, where they submit it, they have time to work on it independently, remotely in this case. Um, and then they come to class later that day so it's not immediate and it's not ideal in terms of the integrity of the instructional cycle, but I have seen it where the student submits it, they get their own grade at a later time. So they don't get that immediate feedback. They come to class and then they start working on the group readiness test, which is the same thing um, as the first piece of activity that they do when they arrive in the classroom. So it gives them maybe a little more time um, where it's not like on the spot, submit the, the questions. But again, that has a different effect in terms of that immediacy of group work based on individual uh, first individual assessment. We have about four minutes left. Uh, maybe take a call. any other questions or comments um, on the presentation topic today. Uh, 
maybe Isabel, you wanted to say more about the comment. I, um, for those who may not be familiar, what what parallels do you see? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> no, I've been a. Um, so we're. I'm working on a, a, a developing and finalizing um, a structure like a faculty fellows program for equity based anti racist writing assessment and pedagogy. So working with Dr. Forbes Bethaud office at the provost office on finalizing it and rolling it out sometime in the fall. Um, we're actually doing. Um, Ashley knows this. We're doing a. Uh, sort of a mini super mini version of this we're giving a workshop a social school uh social uh, 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 school of social work faculty on march 30th around some you know current practices that i've been using that james has been researching my colleague james right in the writing center is my partner on this and what is interesting when i hear there was this team-based learning which i had known about right i mean i know it's it's so widely used in healthcare i think it's it really lends itself to that but it's interesting especially that peer peer aspect that is such a central part of you know writing pedagogy in general but also the work in the writing center where we really kind of we're working with our writing consultants to put them in a position of you know not so much of authority with the students but in this sort of equal space of providing feedback and and collaborating on learning and uh, I know Ashley has a lot of writing center experience as well in teaching writing so uh, we have talked about these kinds of things before so it's really it's really interesting how there are so many any parallels so Zach thank you for um looking forward to the email so I can't wait to uh add some more to my reading I guess list so I, guess, I don't know if I should thank you or curse you <laughs> thank you of course but yeah thanks uh, Christina thanks the looking at it about the writing is really interesting too because um you know when the students leave the school and go on to the work environment and they may become involved in grant writing teams or paper writing teams they'll have the experience of working within teams and receiving giving and receiving feedback that will help make them um, you know more effective team members too not just more effective in their writing or not just increase their learning thank you well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for your participation. And thanks to Dr. Kulo uh, for a very succinct presentation of a sometimes uh, complex instructional topic. Um, we appreciate you joining us today. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.